Hey guys, I have your notes pulled up for section 1.8, and so we're going to go through here and uh, talk about inverse functions. Um, first of all, I think last year you probably learned how to find the inverse, and that's what we're going to do down here is we're going to swap x and y and find an inverse. Pretty sure you've done that. Um, but since we just talked about composition of functions, I want to kind of give you the formal definition of inverse functions. So, formal definition. The formal definition is... Um, well, I don't, I don't see it laid out here, but the formal definition, if two functions are inverses of each other, what's going to happen is if I've got like f and g, if I take g and embed it into f and it simplifies and simplifies to just x and, and I got to check the other way, if I take f and embed it into g and it simplifies and it simplifies and it just equals x, that's like the formal definition. That's how to guarantee that these two inverses are the inverses of each other. This one is this one's inverse, and this one is this one's inverse. That's like the formal definition. You're going to be asked to do that um, like on a paper pencil test, if everybody's taking a paper pencil test. So let me kind of show you. Um, we're going to, you're going to like prove, it says verify. Verify is kind of the same thing as prove. So um, if you remember back in geometry when you had to do proofs and you had to have a column for statements and a column for reasons. Yeah, well, I'm not going to make you do that, but it's like we have to make a deal. You have to show me every single step, one step at a time, and I won't make you do statements and reasons, okay? So you're going to do a proof, and you're going to have two separate functions, and you're going to prove to me that this one is the inverse of this one, and this one is the inverse of, of this one, okay? So, um, let's see. Where, here they are. Here are your two separate functions. We've got f, I color coded it in green, and g, I color coded it in purple. And I want you to prove that they are inverses of each other. Okay? And I'm going to show you how to do it this way. This is the way I expect you to do it. Show your work and label your process. So, two things have to happen I have to bury g in f, and I have to bury f in g. All right, I'll start by taking G and burying it in F. Now, notice I am labeling my work. I'm not just like putting random math on my paper. I'm saying this is the process that I'm doing, and here is what it looks like. So I've got my green function. It used to say 3x minus 4, and I've taken the purple cloud and embedded it into F. All right, now... Um, you you need to start simplifying. So um, if you are going to simplify this, you're probably going to take 3 over 1. You're going to do this multiplication before you do the subtraction. But before you even multiply. So before you actually distribute that out, don't you think you can cancel out your 3s? You certainly can. You can reduce cancel out your threes, and here's what's left. If the threes are gone, then I've got x plus 4 on top, and on the bottom is just 1. So x plus 4 on the top, the bottom is just 1, and then there's still that minus 4. Now collect like terms. You see how this simplified down to just x? Okay, and you see how I showed each step. I showed canceling my threes, I rewrote the problem, and then I collected like terms and I got x for this. Now, let's go the other way. Um, I'm going to embed f into g. So I took the green cloud and put it in the purple function. This used to say 
x plus 4 over 3. Now it says green cloud plus 4 over 3. Um, at this moment, since you have 1, 2, 3, 3 terms on top and 1 term on the bottom, at this moment it's illegal to cancel these 3's because you're not canceling this 3 with everything. Okay. So at this moment, you can't cross out the threes, but you can collect like terms with the fours. So again, one step at a time. It's the price you have to pay for me not making you do statement column, reason column. All right, collect like terms and I get three X on top over three on the bottom. Now you may cancel out your threes and you're left with just X. Okay, so take a minute, make sure you've got that copy down before we move on. And I want to show you what is not accepted on a test. First of all, if this is all you write, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know. There's no label. You're not labeling what you're doing. So again, make sure you label your work. Tell me I am putting, I am um, embedding F into G. So make sure you label it. Okay, that's one thing wrong with what I just did. Also, remember how I said right now it's illegal to cancel these threes because you've got three terms on top and only one term on the bottom? Some of you like to show as little work as possible. This is not the time for that when you're doing a proof. Um, some of you are going to do this. You saw me. Did I cancel correctly? Like, did I collect like terms first and then cancel my threes? I did, but you watched me. Think about how I am grading your paper. So if I'm grading your paper, I didn't see all that happen. I'm just walking up to the problem and thinking, what the heck just went on here? What did they cancel first? What did they cancel second? Why is all this stuff marked out? I have no idea what they did because you didn't show me every step. And so I'll see this on a test and so many people were like, I did, I did cancel the, I marked those out first. I'm like, well, I, I wasn't watching you. And I warn you that you're gonna have to show me every step. So one thing at a time, do your collect like terms, give me a quick rewrite. Come on guys, it's not that hard. I'm not asking you to do that much extra work here. Give me a quick rewrite, then you may cancel those and then you can say it's just X. So because I got this one simplifying to X and this one simplifying to X, I can say yes, F and uh, looks like a plus. F and G are inverses. of each other. I'm guessing that's probably new to you from last year. I don't I don't know that you did like proofs last year on proving that they're inverses. Um, I do think you probably did this last year. So here is where I'm giving you only one function and saying find its inverse, find the other one. So you've got, it's like a four step process. And some of you love steps. You're like, oh, tell me what steps to do and I can do them. Well, here you go. Um, you're, you're more, more than likely your equation is gonna be in function notation. I want you to take it out of function notation and just call it y equals. Um, if it already starts that way, that's great. but before we can go to step two, this has to be y, not f of x. 
And then you are going to swap your x and your y values, or variables. You're going to swap your x and your y variables. You're going to do what you do best. Algebra, algebra, algebra. Solve for y. Get y by itself. And then once you get your equation to y equals, you're going to label it with f inverse of x. This looks like an exponent. If this were on the letter x, it would be an exponent. If this were on a number, it would be an exponent. Because this is on f, it's on a y, and it doesn't mean it's an exponent. It means the inverse of. When you bury this one, or embed this function into this one, and when you embed this function into this one, it sim simplifies to x. That's what that means. Completely different than treating it as, as an exponent. You just have to um, look at the context of the problem. Okay, but anyway, that's what you're going to replace it with. You're going to be done. You're going to circle your answer. Here we go. First one. Step one, I replace this with y. Easy. Step two, swap your x and your y variables. Step three, get this by itself. So you can see I subtracted six from each side, divided both sides by three, and that's what I got. Final step, label this appropriately. So if this was the original f, then this is the inverse of f. We just, we just change that to f inverse of x. Function notation, inverse labeling. Number two, step one, replace that with a y. So easy. Step two, swap your x and your y variables. Step three, solve for y. I squared both sides and added four. Squared both sides, added four. There's my y equals. Change it to function notation labeled as an inverse. Function notation labeled as an inverse. This was the original. This is its inverse. All right, this one got, got really fun. Um, so you can see that I uh, swapped out f of x for y. Now, I'm going to turn these into y's, and I'm going to turn that into an x. Now, this is tricky, but um, so many people get so hung up on, I don't know how to solve this. If you think about how you were taught to solve an equation in algebra, you can totally solve this. Your goal is to get y on one side by itself and everything else on the other. Well, problem. y is both in both the numerator and the denominator of a fraction. So I turned this side into a fraction and I cross multiplied. So I made a little note for you to cross multiply, and here's what I get. I get x times this quantity, and I get 1 times this quantity. Remember your goal. Get y on one side all by itself. Well, right now it's on both sides, and slight problem, y is trapped in the parentheses. You know what to do. How do you get rid of those parentheses? You distribute your x. Now, check this out. See this term? It has a y. See this term? It doesn't. See this term? It has a y. See this term? It doesn't. Every term that has a y in it needs to be on one side. Everything else on the other. You know that. So do it. I don't care which side you go to. Um, you can get all your y's on the left. So keep, get rid of, move over, stay. 
keep this, get rid of that, move that over, set. This next step is the one where you might be like, oh, I didn't think about that. Like, you should totally be able to do all that on your own. This next step is a little bit tricky, and uh, some of you wouldn't think of it if I didn't show it to you. So, I'm going to show it to you. Okay, first of all, I just copied that. Straight up, just copied it, brought it up to the next line. And something I want to point out to you, since you got your Y's on the same side, here's a term that has a Y, here's a term that has a Y. Hmm, both terms have a Y. Pull the Y out. Factor, you do the greatest common factor and pull out a Y. When I pull out a Y from this term, pull out a Y, this is what's left. Minus. When I pull out a y from this term, this is what's left. Now look, y times something equals divide. Get rid of that quantity. So divide by x minus 1, divide by x minus 1, and we're pretty much finished. <laughs> y is equal to what was over there, now divided by my new quantity, and replace it with function notation. Easy. Okay, again, feel free to pause and copy that down, or try to work it out on your own. I'm going to go ahead and move to the back. Um, it wants me to it wants me to make an XY table for a normal cubic. So easy, I can do that. I chose X values like this. Cubed them, cubed them, cubed them, cubed them, cubed them. Now, turns out the inverse of this equation, the inverse of this equation is the cube root of X. How do you graph that? Well, easy. Inverses means my x and my y's have been swapped. So basically, I'm going to take my domain and my range and swap them. That's my domain. It becomes my range and my inverse. Okay? So I know you all can cube numbers. All I did was swap to get those numbers, and, and then what I did is I'm going to graph both functions. So I'm going to graph the original one in like this turquoise, and I'm going to graph the inverse in pink. Okay, just plotting the points. You can pause the video and do that. Just plot the points. Okay, something that I want you to notice is these are two of your parent functions. This is your parent cubic, this is your parent cube root. Okay, and they're labeled. And then um, they have symmetry. I think that if, if you picked up your paper of notes and you held it up to the light, I think you can fold it over so that this blue piece landed on this pink piece and the same thing up there. Here's where your fold line would be. middle of quadrant three and go through the middle of quadrant one. That would be your fold line. Do you know the equation of that line? Slide 50. Inverses have symmetry. Their fold line is always this. It doesn't just have to be a cubic and a cube root. Inverses have symmetry over that fold line. Inverses have symmetry with respect to the line y equals x. So 
Okay, just a little bit further. Um, I know that you know how to do the vertical line test to see if an equation is a function. So you're going to go, yep, that's a function. Yep, that's a function. Yep, that's a function. Okay, but what about this? What if I looked at its inverse? Is that a function? You might be like, oh man, really? I have to like do the whole inverse thing on that and then graph it and then... No, you don't. To see if their inverses are functions, you do the horizontal line test. So, horizontal line test failed. The inverse is not, the inverse of this is not a function. Horizontal line test passes. The inverse of this is a function. Ha, you knew that. You just didn't know you knew that. Isn't the pink the inverse? <laughs> That's a function. Anyway, and then horizontal line test here. Nope, failed the horizontal line test. Its inverse is not a function. Now, new vocabulary. Instead, another way to say, is its inverse a function, we can say, is this one-to-one? -one? And here's what it's asking. Like, the vertical line test, let me make sure I get this right. The vertical line test says each x can only go with one y. The horizontal line test says each y can only go with one x. So that means one to one. one. One arrow leading away from the x's, one arrow leading away from the y's if I looked at them as a mapping. One to one. So another way to say is its inverse a function is to ask, is it one to one? Nope. Failed horizontal line test. Is this one one to one? Yeah. Pass the horizontal line. Is this one one-to-one? -one? Nope. Failed horizontal line test. So horizontal line test gets us like the same result, but I can I can say it two different ways. Um, tells me if it's one-to-one, -one, and it tells me if the inverse is a function. Okay, we are about to wrap this up, and this is where it gets fun. So uh, just a reminder, function notation. When you take an x and you substitute it into a function, when you take a number and you plug it in, what do you get as an answer? We get a y value. What does that mean for an inverse, though? So if I look at the inverse of f, this is how it's labeled. The way that, the way that works is you swap your x and your y. So this is where my x used to be. This is where my y used to be. For f, where are they in the inverse of f? Well, now this number is here because I swapped places. And this number is here. Okay? So when you see this notation, you've got to remember that what you're looking at in this spot is the y value for this guy. When you see this notation, what you're looking at right here is the y value for this guy. And your answer to the inverse, my answer to the inverse is the x value for this guy. Okay? So, um, I want you. This is the graph of f of x, okay? It's a function, we don't have an equation for it. We just know that it looks like this on a graph. This is f. My question is about f inverse. So here's what I want you to recognize about f inverse. Remember, if I'm thinking about the real f, function, this is where its y belongs, 
and this is where it x belongs. For f of x. Okay, so here's f of x. You've got all these, you've got nice ordered pairs on f of x. Find f inverse of 2. Well, if I'm looking, if, if this is asking about the inverse, but I'm looking at f, look at this number as a y value. So do you see somewhere on here where y is 2? Is it here? No. Is it here? No. Is it? It's here. So this is, this is the y. This is where y goes because I've swapped them. What x goes along with that? In the table, I have normal f of x and normal g of x. I've got x's and y's, x's and y's. The question says, um, let's look at g inverse of f of 2. Well, let's, let's go inside first. Let's just work on f of 2. This is normal, straight up function notation. Ready? f of 2. When x is 2, y is negative 1. Now, what we're going to do is I need the answer to f of 2 to go right here. I need the answer to f of 2 to go right here. Okay. Now, this question is about g inverse. I don't have g inverse. I have g. Well, that's perfect. If you have g, keep in mind that's a y. You need the x. If I'm looking at g, that's a y for g. I need the x that goes along with it. Where is where is my y? Oh, right there. My y is negative 1. What's the x that goes along with it? 10. Four. Last one. Use this f to figure out f inverse of 0. Okay, let me just make sure you understand what this is. This is f of x equals 2x minus 3, right? This is like, this is y. You all can call this f of x or you can call it y. If I'm looking at f inverse, what's this? This is a y. I'm looking at f inverse. That's a y. That's an x on regular f. So if I want f inverse of 0, guess what I want to substitute 0 in for up there? I want to substitute 0 in for y. So I'm going to go 2x minus 3 is equal to a y value of 0. Therefore, So for, for regular f, regular f has a y value of 0 and an x value of 3 over 2. The inverse of f has an x value of 0 and a y value of 3 halves. I just swapped those x's and y's out when I talked first about regular f and then I talked about f inverse. Hope that helps. I love inverses. I hope you have fun doing your homework.